Hey guys, it's me, Pastor Tommy, and I am so excited and honored that you are tuning in to our Sunday service today. The message is gonna be great, and our hope is that after this message, you feel edified and encouraged to do the great things God has called you to do. Listen, if you wanna support this ministry, you give at dreamcenterchurch.com. Everything that you give goes to helping us advance the kingdom of God. And not only that, we want you to tune into our Church Center app. That's right, we have an app for you. We want you to download that app. From there, you can see everything that we're doing, even catch a glimpse of some extra sermons and extra things that you could be a part of. All right, we're excited about what the sermon's about today. God bless you guys, and we cannot wait to see you soon. Man, I'm so happy you guys are here. What a great time of worship. We're going to get right into this service. I'm excited about this sermon. I'm not going to lie to you guys. This sermon is uh, convicting. How many guys, how many guys want to be uh, convicted today? Anyone here want to be convicted? The weirdos. <laughs> Conviction's the worst. I'm just kidding. I love it. Well, hey, welcome to church, y'all. It has been a great week. It has been a crazy week. Can I just share a few testimonies? You guys cool with some testimonies? How many of you guys want to hear what God's been doing? Anyone here want to hear what God's been doing? God's been doing some wonderful things. Number one, the most important thing that happened this week is that my wife turned 30. I'm not going to tell you how old she turned. She had a birthday. Uh, I've learned my lesson. Ten years that I'm learning. Susie uh, had her birthday yesterday. Susie, happy birthday. She's in the back holding her baby right now. Love you, baby girl. (laughs) <laughs> that was the worst applaud for a birthday I've ever heard in my life. Uh, not just that, we, we had um, someone just donate majorly to this church right here because of the mission that's going on. We had someone give us a car this week. Uh, we found a bus that we're going to go and purchase this week. Yeah, um, we're expanding our outreach starting this week. Like, it's been like nonstop great stuff. And I feel like it's just been falling on our lap, isn't it, Dad? Yeah. Those, those blessings just keep falling on my lap. It feels like blessings. You guys know what I'm talking about? You better not be listening to that Chance the Rapper, you little sinners. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, hey, guys, welcome, welcome, welcome. If you're, there's people right now listening to this online, I want to welcome the online church as well. How many of you guys are happy that there's people who could be at home right now who can't be here but can still be a part of our church? Isn't that cool? Yeah. I love that, man. I really do. But if you have your Bibles, we're going to Matthew 22. That's where we're going to go today. And uh, today, if you're taking notes, man, uh, the sermon is sitting at the table. We're going to be talking about something really, really cool. How many of you guys know that God is a covenant-keeping God? Everyone in here know what a covenant-keeping God is? Yeah. And this is what it means that he's a covenant-keeping God. We often talk about his promises God has some great promises. You guys know God has some great promises for us. He says you don't have to worry. He'll take care of it. He, he promised us the eternal hope. You guys know what I'm talking about? We have eternity. He is a good God. But how many guys, um, how many guys know what a covenant is? A covenant is a deal. It's a handshake. When you make a covenant with someone, you know, I made a covenant with my wife. Me and Susie made a covenant that we would never leave each other, no matter how rough or how good it is, no matter how old we are, we're not going to leave each other. That's a covenant. It's a two-way promise. And there's a way out of a promise. It, it, it's, it's by breaking the covenant. And so one of the ways that you could break a covenant in marriage, I just read this, is in marriage, if you make a covenant, one of the ways you could break that covenant is sexual morality. That breaks the covenant. That's, there's a promise saying, I will not give myself to anybody else but you, but if I do this one thing, if I break it, if I sin against that covenant, if I, if I say I no longer worry about my covenant, I'm more concerned about my selfish actions, it could break the covenant and it's up to the other person to keep that covenant with you. But they're actually released at that point. Now, as a church, we, we're big believers that, man, no matter what, you should hang on to your marriage. Don't you guys believe that? I really do. No matter what, you should try to hang on to your marriage as long as you can. But the reason why I want to talk about covenant is because today we're going to talk about something I never get to talk about, which is your part of the covenant. You have a role. How many of you guys want to go to heaven? How many of you guys know that's a promise of the Lord? How many of you guys want to go to heaven? Where the heck do the rest of you guys want to go, man? What's going on? This is a bizarre church. <laughs> Can I have that again? How many of you guys want to go to heaven? Raise your hand. I'm like, oh, good, good. Okay. There's a few of you didn't raise your hand, but that's okay. We're cool with that. Maybe at the end of the service, maybe you will. I don't know. 
Now, I, I want to go to heaven. How many of you guys want to have joy and peace and gentleness and kindness and self-control and faithfulness? Anyone in here? I, I do too, man. How many of you guys want to see, like, cool miracles? Anyone in here want to see cool miracles? I always think about miracles. How many of you guys ever read the Bible and think about, like, like, these guys, all these crazy things were happening and just think, I want to see that. I mean, wouldn't it be cool? There's one guy in the Bible, Philip. He teleports. You know how cool that would be, the teleport, guys? I'd be doing that on the daily. I'd be like, oh, look, I need to go home. Bloop, blop. You know, I'd be like doing it all. But there's crazy miracles. and I want those things. I want the, hang on, this bottle is fighting me. I want to see everything in the Bible. I want to experience the God of the Bible. But there's this covenant thing that I want to bring up that you have a role. And so today, I'm going to give you just three areas of what your covenant looks like. And it's not, well, it might be four. It's three-ish, four-ish. One of them might bind together. So if you have your notes, I want you to write down sitting at the table. And I want you to write under that maybe a subtitle, what my part of the covenant is. All right? That's what we're going to be talking about today. So this is the deal. It says this, Matthew 22, verse 1. I'm going to read a few scriptures to you. I want to break it down. This is like a, like a commentary type sermon. It says, And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Right there, number one. This is the deal. Jesus Christ is inviting you and I to have a celebration. How many of you guys like to party? Anyone in here like to party, dude? Yeah, okay, okay. I love to party, man. I really do. Like when I introduce myself, I say, hey, my name's Tom Palmer, and I like to party. Partying is like a blast, right? I, 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 and when I say party, I'm not talking about going and drinking, you know, you little sinners. I'm talking about, I'm, <laughs> I'm talking about socializing. I'm talking about having fun. I'm talking about celebrating. Last night, they brought a cake over to my house. Randy did a huge cake. Massive cake. That's fed 40 people or something like that. Yeah. Big 35. When he's saying happy birthday to my wife, Susie, I give out your age, Susie. I'm sorry. Yeah, 35. She's officially closer to 70 than, than her original birthday. Isn't that crazy? You're old. Anyways, 70 is not old. <laughs> my mom, my mom, my mom's gonna slap me before my wife does. And she's over here. <laughs> yeah, stop digging. I will say this, actually. This is important for you guys to know. She's, I, yesterday, I kissed the oldest woman I've ever kissed in my life. Is that crazy? Is that crazy? Yeah, it is wild. I thought about that. I want to change it for the world. I loved it. It was a great kiss. She's a great kisser. All right. <laughs> hey, Jesus Christ has invited you to something really important. I, I got to make this really clear. The king of kings, the most important person ever has invited you to something. And I want to kind of put this in a little bit more perspective, maybe a little bit more where you could get a good idea. Uh, imagine, and I don't care who or what president you want to pick, but imagine the president of the United States personally inviting you to sit with him. Could you imagine that for a second? I mean, even if you don't like him, you would be excited about that opportunity because then you could speak your mind or whatever, you know? But could you imagine the President of the United States saying, I want to sit with you? Maybe the President doesn't, doesn't mean anything to you. Imagine the world's richest man, Jeff Bezos. Imagine if he hit you up. He's like, yo, you want to come hang out with me? <laughs> How many of you guys would be like, yo, this is crazy. How many of you guys would want to brag to other people? I just got a call from Jeff Bezos. How do you get my number? He's, he owns Amazon. He probably knows everything. You know, like, like how many of you guys would be blown away if the President, or what, what about Prince, is it Prince Charles? Is that who it is? No, who's the, who's the handsome prince who just got married? Prince William, thank you. Daniel, there's marriage counseling later. Uh, yeah. Prince William, what if Prince William was like in America? And he's like, yo, I want to personally invite you to hang out with me. I, I, I love uh, movies. I love celebrities. And I do something, guys. <laughs> you guys don't know this, but it's fine. I'm going to wrap myself out. I, Johnny Depp, you guys know who Johnny Depp is? Anyone ever, you know, you guys all know who Johnny Depp is, right? You guys all know that guy. I reach out to him on a constant basis. <laughs> I do. I reach out to his PR guys. I, all the time, about once every three months, I write him an email. Hey, Johnny Depp, you know, what's up, buddy? Can you, you know, I tell the PR group. That's not the only person I reach out to. I reach out to Kanye West all the time. He's on Instagram, so I think, why not? I'm going to message him. 
yo, Connie, you want to come to church? I said that to him. He, he has a bunch of messages from me saying, hey, if you're in Atlanta, why don't you come to church and hang out? I won't tell you when you're there. I'm lying. I'm going to tell everyone that he's there. But later, not right away. You know who else I hit up? I, I hit up Chance the Rapper. I hit up Tom Hanks. You know why I do that? Because it would be so cool to get those guys saved. Wouldn't it be so cool to see these guys just get radically saved, right? It would be amazing. And I'm not saying, hey, I'm not, I'm not going to get the Kanye thing, but I'm just saying in general, right? And I look at that and go, man, that would be so cool. And I'm going to be honest with you. If they say yes, I'm going to be the most excited person. Why? Because they hold an importance in my life. They're someone special. They're, they have authority in, in, in their reputation. They could do something. They could make moves. When they speak, they speak volumes to millions of people. It's funny, I, I said all those people, uh, but I love the Kanye West one probably the most, because everybody, when Kanye West says something, even if you don't know who Kanye West is, I mean, actually, let me step back. My dad, can I say this about you? My dad knows who Kanye West is. <laughs> My dad. Like, legitimately. He knows who he is. And that blows me away. And if he could come here, I'd be so excited, right? It would be so excited. But this is what I want to tell you really quick. Jesus Christ, the king of all kings, the one who knew you from the womb, the one who said, I destined and I designed you, that one, the one who created the heavens and the earth, and his spirit hovered over the waters and said, there needs to be more in this earth. He's inviting you today to come sit with him. You have the greatest invitation ever. And this is what I love about this invitation. Well, actually, ooh, no, I'm not going to get there yet. Can I just actually talk about point one, about your part of the covenant? Jesus Christ, our Father, our God, our King, is inviting you and I to sit at the table with Him. But the very first thing is you have to be willing the very first thing, the people who turned him away first, it says, man, the, 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 he invited those who were invited to the wedding, and it says they were not willing to come. This is what it means not to be willing. It means that you don't have the desire to do that. You know why it's hard? How many of you guys have ever been to, invited to a wedding that you don't want to go to? Anyone, anyone wants to be honest? It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. And, and, what about the rest of you guys? You guys all like all weddings you go to? Are you like Maddie? Okay, girls, man. Let me just ask the guys. Guys. Have you been to a wedding you didn't really care to go to? Yeah, 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 there we go. Yeah, a lot more response. Uh, maybe it's not a wedding. Maybe we could get something else. Uh, how many of you guys have ever been invited to anything and you just didn't want to go to it? Yeah? Now, how many of you guys had a hard time being honest about it? Anyone ever be, have a hard time being honest about it? Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. We're an honest church here. We're going to tell about our lies here. Not being willing is just saying, I don't want to sacrifice what I'm doing right now to go to that. I got more important things to do right now. Actually, it could be, I don't even have more important things to do right now. How many of you guys have ever not wanted to go to an event because you just wanted to sit around and do nothing? Anyone ever wanted to do that before? Where are my introverts at? Yo, introverts, what's happening? You guys do a lot of bravery to raise your hand just now. I applaud you, my little introverted friends. <laughs> not being willing is just saying, I don't care about this invitation. You and I have a place in the covenant with God. You and I need to be people who are willing to go the distance with Jesus. This is part of our covenant with God. He says, man, I'm inviting you to a, a wedding. I'm inviting you to the celebration of my son. He says, but will you be willing to come? Because here's the deal. This is why a lot of us don't like going to parties when we don't want to go to parties. It means that you have to get dressed. It means that you have to get ready. It means that you got to get in your car. It means you got to put time to the side. It means that you got to bring a present. Oh, I hate bringing presents. Oh, I love buying presents, but can I just tell you, giving presents is so hard because uh, uh, I married someone who just taught me the truth that not every gift is a gift that you want. How many of you guys ever received something you didn't want before? you ever done that? And now I'm self-conscious every time I give someone a gift. Like, I hope they really like it. And they'll tell me, oh, I like it, but I don't believe them. So, <laughs> number one, and you're part of the covenant, is you got to be willing to go the distance with Jesus. He has a feast for you, but your part of the job is to be willing. But it goes on. Next verse, because this one kind of plays in the same place. Verse four, it says, again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed. And all these things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. 
And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. This is what I want to say to you. God put out an invitation to us. And it says that there was people who were not willing to come. They were invited, but they weren't willing. So you know what he did? He told them about how great it's going to be. Can I tell you something that's really important? Because I, I think there's this idea out there that we're just supposed to be suffering under God. But I want to make this clear. We suffer under the world and not under God. And let me clear this up for a second, okay? God wants you to have great things. Yeah, I, I know this. Because every time he tries to get us to do his will, he will always tell us what we have as a benefit. He calls us vessels. You know what it means to be a vessel? That means you receive and then give it out. But the receiving is a part of your Christian walk. That's why he says, if you follow my spirit, I will give you joy. How many guys want joy? He didn't say, if you follow my spirit, I'll make sure you suffer for it. If God said, if you follow me, I'm going to make your life miserable, everyone in here would be like, I don't think I want that. He's a God who knows and created you to be someone who receives. This is what he does. When they say, I'm not willing, he says, well, well check it out, guys. I've, I've, I've prepared a dinner for you. Not, I prepared a dinner for myself, and I want you to come watch me. He said, no, I prepared a dinner for you. He said, I, I'm taking my fatted calves out, my oxen. I've killed them for you. I am sacrificing for you. I want you to come to the wedding for your sake and mine. Jesus Christ, I'm, I'm sorry, our Father, our God, Jesus Christ, I don't care what you say, our King wants you to be at the wedding feast. Can I make that really queer? clear? <laughs> very queer. <laughs> Let me make this very clear here. That means weird, by the way, so don't try to twist that. Let me make this very clear. Jesus Christ isn't inviting you to the wedding just for his own selfish desire. He has something good for you. And he wants you there. Can I say this as clear as possible? I don't care what you look like. I don't care what kind of sin you've had in your life. I don't care how messy you've been. He wants you at that table. And he's going, I will go the distance for you. I will slaughter my own for you. I will take care of my own son for you. I'll put him to the cross for you. But I want you at that table. There's too many people, too many people in the church who feel like they aren't welcome to the table anymore. And the Lord's saying, no, 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 no. I want you there. I will even make the sacrifice for you to come. But this is what happens. Back to our covenant. God said, I want to do this for you. But they said, I have to take care of my farm. Another said, I got to take care of my business. In Luke 14, we see the same scriptures, the same story coming out. And this is what it says in Luke. It says, I, I just bought this piece of land. Let me go take care of it. I know there's a wedding feast, but I have some other responsibilities I got to take care of. Another one says, man, I, I, I just got my business up and running. Let me take care of it. But Father, my relationship with this person, I've been designed. I want a marriage so bad, and my relationship here, God, is happening. I, I, the feast is going to be great, but I have something i got to take care of. Oh, God, I, I, listen, I got my family, Jesus, and I need to take care of my family. I know you're inviting me to get dressed and prepared for your wedding feast, but i got to take care of this business, God. I, I think that's what you want me to do anyways. It says to them, this is what they report back to the king. They made light of his invitation. And their farms, their businesses, their families, their social media status, their political opinion, their answer for everything that they know. How many guys know we all think we know so much? Became more important than prioritizing the wedding feast. This is our part of the covenant that we do not take light the invitation that he's given us. He said, man, I got an invitation for you. I'm, I'm asking you that you come sit at my table. And that we don't go, okay, I'll get to that later. This is the most important invitation that you will ever receive in your life. More important than any political leader, anybody invite you to anything. He's saying, but if you make light of my invitation, he says, I'll give your invitation to someone else. There's been so many times in my life that I didn't prioritize what God was giving me, and I prioritized something else, and I justified it. How many of you guys have ever justified not prioritizing God? I, I justified it. God, I, I know what you want me to do, but I really, 
I really, okay, I'll confess to you. I can't confess to you guys. So uh, years ago, I did a, uh, it's called a vlog. You guys know what vlogs are, right? You guys are young enough to know what vlogs are. And uh, I used to record me and my family's life 24-7. That's what I do, right? Me and Susie. Susie hated it because every day I'd have a camera. And Mike, Micah was there too. Yeah, I got you, buddy. And every day I would record our family because I had this desire. I thought, man, it would be really cool to, to become a celebrity on YouTube. I, I'm, I am self-absorbed. I want you guys to know that, okay? And I'm working on it. Uh, but I thought, man, it would be really cool. I'm sure there's people out there who want to watch me. Why? Well, I sound so self-absorbed talking to you guys about this, actually. Like, I recorded myself and put it on the internet and thought people will want to see this. <laughs> Anyways. I, I recorded myself over and over and over every single day our camera would be out. And we would just record. I would have so much footage, guys, like four or five hours of footage. And then every night I would sit down at home, and, and, I, and for two hours I would edit it. I'd cut it up. I'd be like, oh, this is funny, and this isn't funny, this is, you know, whatever. And I'd put it all together. And I remember, because at the time I was the youth pastor here. I was the youth pastor, and I remember I, I was... To make this really clear, I was called to be the youth pastor here. I was in obedience to the Lord. He told me to be the youth pastor. And this is what I did. I took what he told me to do, and I put it on the back burner so I could make 100 videos for like 20 people to watch. <laughs> I made video after video after video, and I remember so clearly the things that God had invited me or called me to, the things in my family, taking care of my kids, taking care of my wife, the things in the ministry, doing youth ministry. I put it to the side because I thought something else was more important. And God is saying, Tom, no, 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 I'm giving you the most important thing. I'm asking you for me, the king of kings. I, I want to go back to the president. If the president asked you to do something for him, he's like, hey, can you, no, do this for me? We'd be honored. It wouldn't be a service. We wouldn't be sacrificing to do something for a great celebrity or someone we find really important. But I was looking at this going, God, that's not that important. I want to make light of what you're doing because this is more important to me. You and I have an obligation that when we look at the invitation from the Lord that we don't make light of it. And put it out at the bottom of our priority list. That we don't look at our life goals and say, well, this is more important to me than getting ready for the keen. That we don't look at our New Year resolution and we find that our Bible reading becomes nothing and our workout routine becomes more important. That's only like two of us in here, so don't worry about that one. <laughs> that we don't forsake prayer because we'd rather watch our Instagram. That we don't, that we, that we don't forsake memorizing scripture. I want to, oh gosh, can I just talk to you for a second? Me and Susie, Susie got this book. We met this lady at a beach. How many guys know Christians are wild people, okay? So me and Susie are at the beach. We're, we're hanging out. This is back in uh, October. And this lady walks by, and she just wants to talk to us. And we know right off the bat, this girl's a Christian. So we start talking to her, and we're talking about Jesus. She's a radical Christian. And like you guys know, like, there's Christians, and there's radical Christians, you know what I'm talking about? And you know, because the only thing the radical Christians want to talk about is Jesus. And so that's what we talked about. We just sat there and talked about Jesus. And she, she's like, I got a book. I want to send you guys a book. And we're like, yeah, we want to pray. And we sat at the beach for like, I don't know, what, an hour and a half, just talking to the stranger about Jesus, how fun it is, and all these wonderful things. And she sent us this book. And this is what the book said about communist China. It was talking to the leaders before communism took over in the 60s or 70s or whenever that happened. This is church on a history class, all right? Don't judge me. And it said, at church... The, the pastors were saying at, at church we would, we would feed the hungry and we would have worship services and we would preach. But when communism came in and the church was being dismantled, they realized that they never taught the church how to memorize scriptures. And so when Bibles were being taken away, the feeding trough, if you will, the church services were taken away from them. The church congregation, the believers had no idea how to feed themselves. And China went through this terrible time where if you were not a strong Christian, your oil wasn't full, you couldn't make it through the darkest of times. And this, is, this, this convicted me to the core, one, as a leader here, but two, just as a Christian. I've set aside knowing the, and meditating on the Word of God day and night because there's some really good television shows on, on TV. Because I, I love to be entertained. 
I love having progress, and, and these are not bad things, I want to say this, but they're in the wrong priority. And I was reading that book thinking, God, keep us from being a people who don't know how to feed ourselves. Keep us from being a people who don't prioritize, Father. Keep us from being a people who don't make light of this invitation you've given us. Because this invitation is the greatest thing that we could have ever had. That you and I, Gentiles, nobodies, People who don't want to have a part of being Abraham's bloodline have got adopted. And he said, I'm going to invite you to my wedding. And this is what we've done. We said, well, it's good, but not right now. I'll get back to it later. A little, can I just say some things for a second? A little adultery in my relationship is not that big of a deal. A little slander and gossip in my relationship with the Lord is not that big of a deal. It's okay. It's how I make my friends. Not thinking of the things above, like Scripture tells me about, but being depressed, thinking about the misery of this world and being consumed by it. It's not that big of a deal. And we've lost the reality of the weight of the invitation. I want to talk about new believers before I read the Scripture further on, because I, I do want to read it further on. How many of you guys have ever met a new believer and they're crazy for Jesus? Anyone ever meet that before? How many of you guys have ever met Maribin? I was going to use you, Maribin, because you're up here and you're laughing. And I think you're in the place right now. Maribin got out of jail for murder. I'm just kidding. No, Maribin, um, <laughs> she's sorry. Right. That's messed up. That's a sick joke. I shouldn't say that. Maribin uh, uh, got saved. How long did you get saved? October 4th. 1145. <laughs> 2020. In the second or third row, I can't remember. She got saved, and now everyone who knows this girl knows that she's crazy for Jesus. Have you guys noticed that? She's the one who, who claps at during service when no one else is clapping. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like, there was one Sunday, I remember I was up front, and I was hearing people yelling, you know, Doreen, she left, I guess, but Doreen was screaming. I'm like, okay, there's some screaming in here, you know. And then we're up here, and all of a sudden I hear Maribin just clapping, yes, Jesus. And something happened inside of me. Oh, yes, Jesus, still. And Susie, too, all of a sudden, this whole front row, we're all vibing. I don't know what you guys were doing behind us, but up front, we're vibing, man. We're going in. And almost every week, we go home, we talk about, we, we, we talk about you almost every week. Mayor Ben is on fire for God. She is crazy for Jesus. Every time I talk to her, you know what she wants to talk about? Hey, how can we do more ministry? Can you connect these ministries? We'll do more ministry. We'll reach these people. Do you know what's cool about new believers is that the invitation is still fresh, that it's the most important thing. And they get so radical, they go, I'll give up everything. I'll count the cost. This is the best invitation of my life. I get to sit at that table. Uh, does he know, does the king know how terrible of a person I've been? And he wants me to sit at his table? See, when you know the weight of the invitation, you become a radical Christian. Lukewarm happens when you think it's not that important anymore. I'm okay, it says in scriptures. It says, I, I have food to eat. Revelations 3, the lukewarm church. He says, you say that you have all this, but you're blind and you're naked and you're poor. And if you just let me in, if you just realize the invitation that I have for you, he says, I will clothe you. Number two of our covenant is that you don't just have to be willing. You can't make light of the invitation. And then verse 6, we talked about they, some of them seized the servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. And verse 7 says this, but when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. And this isn't part of the sermon, but I want to actually say this for a second. God is the same God as he was yesterday, today, and forevermore. How many of you guys know that? And when I read this scripture, and when we get to the end of the scripture, I'm going to talk about a characteristic of God I don't know if we talk about a lot. I think there's been a lack of the fear of the Lord in, our, in, our, in our, our, my life, at least. And maybe yours too. But anyone who came against his servants, it wasn't like instantaneous, but he said, I'm going to send out my wrath against them. So the king destroys them. In his anger, by the way, Verse 8 says this, Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. I want to say this about invitations, not being willing to go and making light of it. 
is where you lose your worthiness of it. Can I say that one more time? You lose your worthiness of the goodness of God when you make light of it and you're not willing for it. It doesn't say because they were sinful. It says because they didn't care. Therefore, the king said, go into the highways and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad. Everyone say bad. And good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. I'm not breaking this scripture down about the Jews and the Gentiles, and that's what this is really talking about, but I do want to say something. God had an invitation for people that he already selected, and they said no to it. They killed their prophets. But this is what he does. This is what the king does. This is what our father does. He says, I want you to go out in the highways. I want you to go out in the byways. I want you to go out in the muck and the mire. I want you to go find the Paul Palmers and the Patties, little, you know, uh, uh, what is Duffy Saloon? Uh, go using his cocaine money at Duffy Saloon. Go find that guy and invite him over to my house. Amen. Go find the people who are not worthy. It says the good and the bad. He says, I want everybody invited. This scripture right here is a great example of why our church, we believe we should be a church for everyone because the invitation is for everyone. Amen. It's not just the one the king's good friends with. It's the one that are out in the streets and the muck and the mire and there's sin and it's disgusting. God's saying, I'm willing to invite you. Regardless of where you're at, regardless of how good you are, regardless of how bad you are. How many of you guys are so happy he's inviting the bad to the celebration as well? Isn't that so good? He says, no, no, no. I want you to go out and invite everybody. As a church, we believe that everybody should be able to walk into these doors. There should not be one person who can't come into this door. Politically, we don't care. Sexual orientation, we don't care. Do you hear me on that? Hang in there. Your race, we don't care. Your age, we don't care. You're invited. We don't care what kind of sin you got. I don't care if you really did just murder someone. We want you. The invitation's yours. I don't care if you sinned last night. I don't care if your computer screen is the thing you messed up with or maybe the person you shouldn't be sleeping with is the thing that messed you up. You're invited in. You got pride? Oh, we've all had that. Come on in. You got a home? Come in. You don't got a home? Come on in. The invitation is for everyone. I want to make this very clear. The church celebration, who we are as a church and what the church is globally is not a bunch of people who walk and talk a certain way. It's a bunch of people who said, I got invited that I'm going to go to. And that means that we walk and we talk and we do everything a lot different. How many of you guys have ever noticed church is supposed to be full of every nation and every tongue and every background? You guys hear me? Because how many of you guys know in Revelations it talks about heaven and it says heaven is filled with every nation and every tongue. And they're all saying what? Worthy is the Lamb. You and I have been invited. And there's not one person, I want to just make this clear, there's not one person who doesn't have this invite. And can I tell you something? You should be telling them, hey, you know you've been invited to see Jesus today. But this is where it gets crazy. <clears throat> but when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there who did not have on his wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, everyone say friend. friend. That word needs a sink in. Can we do that one more time? Can everyone just say friend? friend? How did you come in here without your wedding garment? And the man was speechless. And the king said to the servants, bind him, hand and foot, take him away and cast him into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This verse uh, makes me choke up like crazy because this verse is the one thing I don't think we talk about when it comes to covenant. <clears throat> I know I personally, I, I always like to preach about I always like to preach about his goodness, and his goodness is super important. I don't want to miss his goodness. His goodness is that he'll sacrifice the ox and the calf for you. He'll put you in on the invite list. He'll put your name down and say, come on in. But this part of the covenant kills me is that he doesn't want you to come in the clothes that he invited you in. You see, when he gives you the invitation, and he says, hey, I want you to come and be with me, 
want you to come and, and, and dine with me. That invitation is for where you are right now today. But when it comes to going to his wedding feast, he expects you to be changed. Amen. And this is what I mean. Is that for too long, we've thought, well, God invited me so I could go to him exactly as I am. And I don't have to change anything. Yeah, I'm in a terrible, adulterous relationship, but God still invited me, so obviously he's okay with this. He will forgive me. Oh, yeah, I, I, I know I got gossip and slanders, but I don't need to let that go. He invited me, so obviously I'm going to be just fine in heaven. You know what this says? This is friend. That means someone I know, someone I've talked to, someone I have trust in. How is it that you came here and you didn't change your clothes? How is it that you came into my wedding and you weren't dressed for it, but you came in the same clothes that you were invited in? Don't you understand the weight of my invitation? I didn't invite you to come and play video games at my house. I called you to come to the wedding feast, and you and I have a covenant with him where we're called to change and be prepared for what he's called us to. But this should rattle you to the core because I can't stop thinking about the end times. And I know I'm not, I'm not even going to say the end times are tomorrow. They might be. I have no idea. But I'm kind of like my dad. I just think, like, if it's bad, it'll get worse, you know. But this thing has been shaking me all week. Last week, I, I forgot to tell you guys this. Oh, my gosh, I totally forgot to tell you guys this. I'm church. I'm so sorry. Can we pause for a second right here? I've been shaking on this all week because I was planning on preaching a different sermon to you guys. I want to preach it next week and I want to preach about identity. Because last Sunday I came to church in disguise. I sat by Renee over here. And if you saw me, I was in camo and I had a beard glued to my face. I had really bushy eyebrows. I told people I was Trevor's father because Trevor has these like perfect eyebrows. And I thought, well, I got these nice thick eyebrows. I came to church, and it was interesting. I, I came because I was supposed to be in Africa, and I canceled last minute. And uh, so I, I came into church, and I thought I would like to come to church and not be known. And we're going to talk about identity, and I, I actually was sitting there. I was writing down my notes while my dad was preaching. And I was writing down my notes, and I thought, man, I, I, and the Lord just spoke to me. and said, you need to preach about the wedding feast. And I thought immediately, like, oh, yeah, that will work perfectly for me, for my sermon. And I read this, and I just got shook to the core because... Too many of us have been waiting for the wedding day. It's taken too long, so we just decided, well, I don't need to be ready for it anymore. And I could be okay. And this is where I get most convicted, just so you know. I don't get convicted necessarily. I mean, I do, but it's not like these major sins in my life. And, and for you, there may be major things that God's saying, I, I'm not going to allow you to sit at my dinner table like this. I'm not going to allow you to be at my wedding supper like this. But for me, it's the little things. For me, it's the TV shows that I watch. I, I keep trying to watch this show. I try it every year. It's called Arrested Development. Has anyone ever watched that show? It's a whole, I, I'm going to be honest with you, it was my favorite show forever. The whole three seasons of it. And it's not a Christian show. It's not VeggieTales, you know. It's not a, it's a worldly show. And my wife, Susie, how many of you guys have ever married someone who's a better Christian than you? Anyone in here? Yeah, all husbands, raise your hand. There it is, yeah. Eli. Okay. <laughs> she just said, Tom, how can you watch that? I said, well, it's funny. It's hilarious. I mean, it's, how many of you guys ever watched Arrested Development? How many of you guys think it's a funny show? It's like a clever show, yeah. I love that show. I quote it every once in a while. You guys don't know it, but I quote it every once in a while just because it was so funny to me. And she says, are you going to excuse the way that you are? Are you going to excuse your blemishes for the, the sake of laughter? I'm convicted. What are you talking about? Are you gonna are you gonna allow these things in your life? Is this where you're gonna lower your standard because laughter is your goal? Of course, Susie, you're like, no, it's fine, you know. <laughs> thinking about every excuse I could think of, you know. You watch Praise Baby, you know. I don't know. I was trying to think something up. I was just watching the kids. For me, it's that I'm starting to take lights of the invitation. That I allow in my life, and I agree with, and I celebrate, and I laugh a little bit of adultery here, a little sexual morality here, a little homosexuality there, and I'm allowing these sins uh, just be normalized in my life where I go, well, we're still dressed pretty nice for the wedding. 
When reality, in contrast of the invitation, I know when I look at my life and when I allow in and, I, and my preparation of my heart, <clears throat> I'm trading the clothes that God has for me for the things that I think are most comfortable. And I want to walk in a comfortable Christian life. And this is the deal. You and I won't get into the wedding feast without being changed first. Your part of the covenant is that you're willing, that you'll go the distance, that you won't take it lightly, but most importantly, that you'll change. That you'll say, I'm going to get rid of the garments of depression, and not saying like depression, I'm not saying depression in the sense of the mental capacity. I'm saying that I'm no longer going to let this be a dictator of my life, but rather, I'm going to let anxiety no longer be a dictator of my life, but rather, God, I'm going to lean on you in these areas. No longer, God. No longer, Father, am I going to let sexual morality come into my life. I can't lean on that anymore. No more excuses. No more because it's because I'm up too late. No longer am I going to excuse this uh, a relationship that I know is sinful. No longer am I going to lay on this anymore. i got to change because i got to get at that wedding table. This is what Jesus says in Revelations 3. If I could read it to you, it won't be on the screen. I'm going to not even ask you to put it on the screen. Don't put it on the screen. I'm just going to read it to you guys. He wants you at the wedding table. He wants you there, but this is what it says to the lukewarm church. And if I could just be honest with you, this whole sermon kind of feels like it roots into the lukewarm. That you're going to try to show up, you and I are okay to showing up to God's great things and the great things that he has for us. And we're satisfied not having his covenant fully held with us. That we don't see us cast out demons, healing the sick, and prophesying. That we don't see the joy and the peace and the gentleness and kindness. And we're not seeing the promises of God's side. And we've been satisfied in, in the status quo of going, I'm okay. And we've been staying in our same garments. Never changing for the Lord. Never realizing the weight of the invitation. It roots back to this right here, this lukewarmness, this I like what God has, but not enough to make a real change in my life. It says, verse 15, I know your works. Now, you're neither really cold or hot, but I wish you were cold or hot. In other words, he's saying, I wish that you took my invitation seriously or you didn't care at all, but that this middle ground of going, yeah, I want your invitation, but I don't think I'm going to get ready for you. He says, it's worse. He says, man, I will vomit you out of my mouth like it's disgusting to me. Because you say I'm rich, I become wealthy and I have need of nothing. And you do not know that you're wretched and you're miserable. He's saying, you know why you don't know you're miserable? This is why you don't know you're miserable. You don't know you're miserable because you've never known what it meant to be not miserable. You don't know what it is to lack joy until you have the joy of the Lord. He's saying, you're saying you're fine. You've just, you've just been status quo. Nothing's ever changed in your life. Joy and peace and gentleness are radical for God. It all died down. You're going, but I'm fine. He's saying, oh, but you're wretched. You're miserable. If you only knew how good it could be. You're not rich. You're poorer than ever. You're blind. In other words, you can't see. You don't understand. You think you have all the answers. You think that you could debate people into believing why Christians should be a certain way when it comes to voting and politics. He says, you're blind. He says, don't you see? That's not even the important things. I never called you to be a political changer. I called you to be an ambassador. He says, you're naked. You know what it means to be naked? It means you're unprepared. And he says this to you and I. Church, I counsel you to buy from me gold. We find in the fire, I'll make you rich. He says, white garments. In other words, garments fit for a wedding feast. That you may be clothed. That the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with Islav, that you may see as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Therefore, be zealous. It says to be zealous. It's telling you and I that you and I should be radical Christians. Amen. We're called to be zealous. He says be zealous and repent, man. Get rid of this lifestyle. And this is what he says. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him 
and he with me. And that's what he says. And to him who overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame. And sat down with my father on his throne. My worship team, my friends, you guys can come up here because we're going to end this thing. I want to say this to you. We have a God who says, I got a covenant for you. And it's a killer covenant. It's an awesome covenant. It's the best covenant in the world. I will give you food. I will make you rich. I will give you all that you need. But most importantly, I'm going to give you heaven. This is the most important invitation in the world. He says, I'm going to give you the eternal hope that you and I don't die. Isn't that crazy? I feel like a weirdo up here even saying that because it feels like a superhero movie. It sounds like a myth. You don't die. You have an eternal life. That when you die on this earth, it's your flesh goes but nothing else. That you are eternal and he has that invitation for you. And this is what he says. He says, man, if you will just get ready. He says, I don't care where you're at today. I don't care how nasty your life is today. But if you would just prepare yourself. And Luke would tell the same story. The next part of the parable, he goes into talking about counting the cost. If you're going to go to the wedding, you got to know what it's going to cost you. To change your clothing, to prepare your hearts and say, God, I will show up today. I will show up knowing the importance of being at the wedding feast. But this is the beauty of his covenant. See, the man who showed up, not in the wedding garments, it says that he bound him hand and foot. And, and I'm just going to make it literal for you. It says that he cast him into the lake of fire. He cast him into hell. Oh. It wasn't that he said, okay, go change. He said, no, no, no. I bound them up. And I cast them into the place where there's gnashing of teeth. Gritting so hard that their teeth are gnashing together. There's wailing and weeping. He says, that's where I cast them. Because they showed up to my invitation. I told them what I would give to them. And they were lukewarm about it, saying, I'm okay. I got other things I got to handle. I got, I got a farm. I got a life. I got a business. And he's going, what? I'm the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And your heart towards me is that, God, I'm okay. I don't need a lot of help. Your heart towards me is I'm rich. I'm fine. I don't need you much in my life. Your response to me is that you're happy when really you have no idea how miserable you are. And he said, I'm counseling you. I'm begging you. I'll give you my gold. I will even give you the garments for my wedding feast. I will even dress you. All you got to do is let me into your life. Stop prioritizing everything else. You know why this shakes me to the core? Because I even know that in my own life, I've allowed the things of this world to take precedent over the things of God. And I've excused a lack of radicalness in my life with the logic of the world. And I've excused the lack of peace and joy, sound mindness, faithfulness, and the fruits of the Spirit. I've excused them not being effective because of special circumstances or getting priorities straight in my family. And I should have you go to Luke, and I, I, I'm going to encourage you to go read this in Luke as well. He says this in Luke. He says, if you can't Hate your family for my sake, your children for my sake, your parents, your spouse for my sake. He says, you're not worthy of this. You know what he's saying? He said, if you don't make this the most important invitation in your life, he says, then you're not even worthy of my invitation. He says, if this doesn't conquer your life, that all you do for the rest of your life is prepare for the wedding day, he says, you're not even worthy of it. He says, that's lukewarmness. And I'm looking at this scripture, and I too know that I need an altar today. But I know I'm not alone. But I need an altar. This is what altars are. A place 
of remembrance. And today I need an altar that I could go to and say, God, I don't know if I'm dressed today for the wedding feast. But I don't want to miss it. I, I don't want to take light. I want to go to that wedding. But I need a place, Father, to make my covenant back with you that I will be dressed this time. That I won't come into your wedding casually, making light of your wedding, but rather I'm going to come to your feast prepared. And the thing is, I know I'm not the only one in here who's had a lackluster Christian life. I'm not the only one in here who hasn't filled my oil up for the midnight hour. I'm not the only one in here who's traded the things of the world, the good things of the world, my land, my money, me taking care of my responsibilities, and traded it for the things of the world. Today, if you're in here today, I, I want to do something. I'm not going to do a regular altar call. I'm only going to give you like 10 minutes before I excuse everybody. It's only 11.25 in 10 minutes. I told the, the, everybody at the staff, I said, 11.35, we're going to be out of church from here on out. That's going to be our, our, our timing. But that doesn't mean that you leave church. That just means we're going to, you know, make an exit. But today I want to open up these altars for you and I to put our face down today. And say, God, I'm ready to be zealous and repent that I've made light of your invitation. That I took it from years ago and I set it to the side and I yearned to be like the new believer who just got their invitation and was excited about it. I'm ready to be zealous. So today I want to open up the altars. I want to open up the floor. I want to open up your chair to be a place of remembrance today. That on January 24th, 2020, a bunch of people got dressed. A bunch of people decided, I'm going to be ready this time. A bunch of people decided, I'm going to lay down all the things that I thought were good. And I'm going to say, God, my focus is now on you. And I want to make something clear. I don't think everyone needs to do this. But if you have even a slight idea that you need to do this, I'm going to say you should do it. Because it's not worth getting there and him calling you friend. The one I talk to, the one I call my friend, why weren't you ready? So can we take 10 minutes? Can we open up the floor? Can we open up the altars? Can we get our faces a little dirty? Can I get my white pants? I got white pants on, guys. I, that's crazy. Say, it's okay. This is more important. Can we do that today? Hey, I hope you enjoyed that sermon. And listen, we got a lot more of those. Get on the Church Center app right now. Log into the Dream Center Church, your favorite church, and check out all the sermons. Listen, if you want to support this ministry, all your funds will help us advance the kingdom of God. We would love for you to support your favorite church in this ministry. You can do that right now at dreamcenterchurch.com. Hey, God bless you guys, and go and do the great things God has called you to do. See you later.